So let us just begin then. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, uh, I cannot share the video. You cannot see my face because you know I cannot use both video and uh, presentation. So for the sake of you know clarity, I thought maybe you know it would be better if we, you know if I share the PowerPoint slides rather than you know look at my face. <laughs> so nevertheless. Um, I think we'll start. All right, let's let's start. I think uh, we I think we have wasted enough time. Mm, okay, here we go. I hope you guys can see the screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Anybody? Problem slide. Sir. Yes. We can good. Good. See. Okay. So here we go. Um, yeah, so today's discussion, right, um, is not so much about, you know, a lecture on obedience, right? Uh, but then um, the main purpose of this discussion this afternoon is, is to discuss or ignite and bring to our attention, right, some of the most relevant themes concerning the way we perceive and understand our role and responsibilities to the society. Uh, so, in other words, the, the, the main purpose of this discussion today, this afternoon, is to examine the psychological factors behind uh, society's obedience, or what, or what is known as society's political obedience, and also look at some of the consequences of such obedience and how they are manifested in the psyche and the consciousness of its people and society at large. In other words, the, the main question is that to what lengths, right, to what lengths people obey authority without question, right? What enables us, people like you and me, to thoughtlessly, right, blindly obey those we deem to be in the position of authority, right? This type of questions are very, very pertinent or very, very relevant in societies such as Nagaland, right, or even India, because in our society like Nagaland and India, we highly, you know, we prioritize categorization, right? We like to categorize into tribes, into castes, into religion, and so on. So, and so asking such questions, right, uh, gives us valuable insights into, into the nature of, say, for instance, uh, social political conflicts and tensions that continue to trouble such a, a highly divisive society like, like Nagaland and India. You see, uh, for the purpose of this, uh, this, this lecture, by obedience or political obedience, I mean performing an act, right? I mean the performing an act or carrying out action because, it, because someone in a position of authority commanded you to do it, not because you want to do it out of your own desires or out of your own will. In political sense, it is an obligation towards the state or the group or your or your community, what not. So obedience in this context can be understood as a psychological mechanism that links individual actions to political purpose. It binds, for instance, it binds us, you and me, to a system of authority, right? And by far, we can argue that one of the most far-reaching implications, the consequences of obedience or submission to authority is the disappearance of a person's sense of responsibility, right? Rather than assert, we may think that by obeying, we are asserting our responsibility, but then in reality, whenever we, whenever we blindly obey, we are actually, you know, re uh, relinquishing our own sense of personal responsibility to which we will return to later in the talk. So the thing is, you may ask, well, what is wrong with obedience, right? It is beneficial. Of course it is beneficial, you know, in uh, relationships such as uh, between a parent and a child, of course obedience is very important. And of course, even in society, you need some sort of obedience from the from the citizens so that it can be, so that uh, obeying laws or whatnot can prevent theft and murder, etc. But, in some cases, and in some more important cases, right, obedience can lead to brutal outcomes, right? You don't even have to look far. If you just give a quick glance at history, you'll find uh, examples, so many numerous examples, such as Hitler's Germany, or Stalin's Soviet Union, or Mao's China, and uh, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, where its citizens, during these times, remained obedient to the point of committing, and they did commit, some of the most atrocious acts, right, 
that includes you know murdering and torturing one's neighbor friends right and completely innocent people and in mass this is something that gives me up late at night right thinking how easily such kind of atrocities can also occur not only in india but also here in nagaland right where we are where friends and neighbors can very easily butcher each other in the name of tribe right very easily if you look at the examples of rwanda for instance right in rwanda in 1992 you had this genocide going on between the hutus and the tutsis right people started killing each other they started killing each other not because you see not not because you know uh, they they dislike each other but because they belong to a different race uh, they belong to a different tribe right neighbors killing each other even the church even the catholic church was involved was complicit in the propagation of of killing their own church members just imagine even the church was involved so in other words this our 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 sense of affiliation with our group is very very powerful and which something that we all have to you know uh, understand and examine very very deeply you know one can only watch in great horror and bewilderment the extent to which you know we like you and i almost with blind faith obey those we deem to hold legitimate authority and if, if you remember freud one of the leading uh, uh, um, scholar thinkers in, in in psychology freud recognized this and he was saying that we should never under we should never underestimate the power to uh, the power of the individual to need to obey right we need somebody to obey we, we want to obey it is more or less like an instinctual but then it is also very interesting to note that most people are involved in such kind of you know uh, uh, um, acts not because not because uh, of any other uh, um, personal um, want to you know to destroy each other but because they don't want to be excluded the fear of exclusion right they don't want to be rejected by their own group this fear of being rejected or alienated by one's own tribe or group right to a certain degree accounts for the fact that many people fail to recognize and acknowledge the injustice committed by their own tyrannical tribe or group or, 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 or whatever right because whenever you obey whenever you do as uh, obey and give your uh, undying faithful obedience to your to your group or whatever you don't see such kind of uh, stupid uh, bloodthirsty act as something hideous right you don't see it as a crime but you see you committing those acts as an act of loyalty as an act of duty right just look at just look at you know like how easily in nagaland or like how easy easy it is in india in the name of religion between the hindus and the muslims they'll be willing to kill each other same thing even in nagaland not too long ago not too long ago right such things did happen between tribes here in nagaland right so it's always there we have this powerful tendency to perceive and hold one's groups customs traditions practices as inherently and obviously true right and good regardless of what those beliefs and practices and mores are we must also understand that if you actually think about it and if you actually observe carefully many of us don't actually understand what we believe in right this is evident in the blind conformism and obedience we find in society right this is uh, visible especially when individuals like you and i are in are in a group or when you and i are immersed in a are immersed in a crowd as uh, you know labon um, the, the social psychologist of um, 18th century france um, yes 19th century uh, um, social psycho social psychologist labon notes that individuals whenever you and i like whenever you and i are immersed in a crowd we we become very very obedient right all the base qualities of human nature such as anger and fear and aggression and dominance it takes over and the and the individuals like you and i we lose our conscious personality right we lose our conscious personality and uh, and when we do lose our personal uh, conscious personality we also we also uh, for as you can see on the screen that's uh, like some uh, examples of it we also lose this power to reason we lose our rationality right this is why in a crowd 
This is why the crowd is only capable of, for instance, bloodshed and destruction and chaos, right? They can never construct anything, right? So much so that, like, even the most law-abiding citizens in the crowd will act and do things which he would not otherwise do on his own, right? This is because, you know, what crowd provides is anonymity, right? Anonymity. As you can see on your screen, right? As you can see on your screen, the the slides here. This is a slide during the ULB election, right? And this is a, I need to remember. I think this was in 2014 or 15, right? The lynching of an innocent person. You see, in such kind of things, it is try try to reason out. You are in the midst of this chaos, right? And you try to say, okay, now, okay, my friends, let us stop and think carefully what we are doing. Will you be able to say that? Of course not, right? Who listened to you? You will be swept by the sentiments of the crowd. Right? Imagine over here in this uh, lynching, uh, lynching case, right? This innocent person was lynched without even knowing exactly why. And in the end, now we now know that he was innocent, right? He was innocent. You even see all these things, all, all the students actually, you know, you see them. You, you can actually identify which, uh, from which colleges they were, right? Oh, by the way, can you, can you guys see my presentation? Can you guys see the slides? Hello? Can you guys see the slides? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Any reply? Can you guys see the presentation? Uh, yes, it's visible now. And you're audible. Okay, so you can see this uh, presentation also, right? Yeah, yeah, we can. Uh, yes, it's visible. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. All right, so, so you see those. I mean, those are a good examples of, you know, what happens. Thank, thank you. Uh, what happens, you know, these people, these students, yeah. actually, you see, what, what, why, I'm sure these students, as you can see on your screen, they are some really good students, right, uh, to give the benefit of the doubt, right? They are really good students, but then maybe they are, they are, they are, they are the kind of good students that you, that you want as a, as a teacher. But then in a crowd, you see, they become wild. They are like, they are unrestrained. There's no rationality. So in a crowd, this is what happens. This explains the chaos. You can't build anything. You can only create chaos, right? So... But, uh, but, uh, but in terms of, of, of our discussion today, such kind of crowds, right, they come to play an essential role. They come to play an essential role for tribal leaders, right, They're for tribal and, communi uh, and communal leaders, and even for politicians, because, because it attends, because it enables them to attend, it enables them to attend certain uh, socio-political and economic goals. And these masses, these crowds of masses, they are willing, they, are, they become a willing slave to the will of their tribal masters and communal masters. In the crowd, the individual loses his unique personality, right? his unique individual pers uh, characteristics, which make you and I who we are. So in the crowd, that is lost, right? And when our, our unique individuality is lost, it becomes easier for us to be controlled Right by the tribal leaders and our communal leaders, whoever they are. That's why you know in Nagaland, for instance, this has happened so many times in Nagaland. Whenever when any kind of pan uh, pan occurs, or whenever there's some sort of a uh, tribal leaders calling their tribal people to come and protest against something, what do they say? They always ask every member of their tribe to come wearing to come wearing with their traditional attires, right? As you can see on your screen, this is what happens. And what happens when you do that? When everybody wears their own tribal attires, what happens? When this happens is that you are lost. You are no longer recognizable, right? What makes you you is lost. You are now a number among many, right? You are now just a clock in the machine, right? You are easily replaceable. You are replaceable. You are no longer special, right? And you are in control without even you knowing that you are uh, that uh, that you are being controlled, right? Just like your mobile phones, just like your laptops from which you are using the laptops and the uh, mobile phones through which you are listening to this lecture. All these things are replaceable, just like that. Just like your shoes, your pen, your pencils, right? Your mobile phones. You and I become easily replaceable. Even if you are lost, even if you die in the process, who cares? You, you can be replaced by somebody else from your tribe, right? So who cares? 
So if you're looking for a concrete example, these are the cases. You know, you look at the ULP election, all the all the mela in about the ULP election, all the lynching case shared not just in Nagaland but also all over India, for example. You know, in this kind of things, no one asks questions, right? You don't ask questions. Indeed, it, it thrives. The crowd thrives on not asking questions. This is an essential aspect of being part of a crowd or a group. The space or the room for asking questions or even to think is drastically reduced and even violently removed, right? You are more or less not allowed to think. Just obey. Just obey what you've been told. Just like the one you see on your screen. You see, you see you know, a bunch of ships. You know, they're all going along, the, uh, falling down the cliff. And then, wait a minute, something feels wrong. One of the, you know, mouse asked. And then what, what, what do the other tell him? You know, see? They say, shut up, you moron. Do as you've been told. It's for your own good, right? This is what happens, right? In your group, in your own group, be it religion or your tribe or whatever, right? This is what happens. You can't ask questions, right? If you want to be in the group, do what, we are, do what you are told. Don't ask questions. Which brings us to... Which brings us to examine some of the social, uh, social psychological factors behind obedience, right? So in a series of experiments conducted in the United States, I won't go into the experiments because we don't have time for it, obviously. So in a series of experiments conducted in the United States, uh, the, those experiments showed that when you and I are placed in a powerful social situation, right, such as in a crowd or among our members of our own tribe or among our colleagues, right, or friends, we will we are willing not only to go against our own beliefs and values, but we are also willing to suspend our own judgment, right? This was one of the major findings to the show that you know, like people like you and I, like you and me, we are willing to we are willing and also prepared. Just imagine we are prepared to suspend our own judgment in order to fall in line. Right. In order to fall in line and uh, conform with a collective view of the group, right? To conform with the group's faulty judgment. Even when you know that the judgment of your group is wrong, you still go along with it. Just like the one you see on your screen right now, right? See over here, you have the balls, and then everybody say, "Oh yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Count me in. Top notch. Great idea, chief. You know, couldn't be better. I'm with you. Oh, are you brilliant, right?" All suck ups, right? That's what that's what we are. You know, in a in a in a uh, in a in a group. Whenever we are in the group, do you think you can? When everybody agrees with the boss, be it in a university or college or an office, wherever it is, or even among your friends, do you think when everybody agrees, do you want to be the big, you know, pain in the bottom who says, no, 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 I don't like that idea, right? No, of course not. Just like a student, right? Whenever the students, they may have questions in the classrooms, but then they don't want to ask. Why? Because they're wondering what the other, the rest of the students will think about it. It's not, you don't want to look stupid, right? Maybe you think that in a crowd, you begin to, you begin in a, in a crowd, right? In a crowd, you begin to doubt your own judgment, right? This shows how majority, right? How the views of the majority can exert a powerful impact on the judgment of the minority. Right. Everybody wants to be the suck up. And everybody wants to say, okay, okay, fine, fine, let's go along with it. Even when you know that it is wrong. Right? Like just just for for instance here in Nagaland, because we're in Nagaland, right? In a tribal society like Nagaland, would you go up against the decision of your own tribe? Right? Even when you know that they are wrong, would you be comfortable questioning the judgment and the intelligence of your tribe? Would you? Of course not. You won't. Or if you are, if you are, if you are working in your uh, maybe in your universities, in your colleges, or wherever in the workplace, do you want to go against everybody's wishes? Do you want to go against and point out that everybody is wrong and that you are right? Of course not. So here we are. This is what happens, and this is what exactly what uh, the experiments show, right? So in this way, in, in this way, such conditions, right? In such examples, powerfully illustrates, you know, how easily ordinary people like you and I can be influenced into committing atrocities, right? Just look at Rwanda, just just look at Nagaland also. You don't even have to look back, right? Few years back, I mean, to 10 years back, five years back, you'll find such kind of examples happening. So I think we have to, you know, like, look into these issues, I mean, examine it carefully. In other words, what this finding suggests was that how social conditions, right, or the circumstances 
uh, which are actually shaped by our own groups or society's norms and values, they influence our tendency to obey and go along with the crowd, right? go along with the group, even when we know that the judgment of our group is faulty or wrong. So this partly indicates um, not only um, our tendency to fall in line and go along with the group judgment, group's judgment, but also uh, the enduring and almost instinctual need to obey the command of our authority, right? Or your tribal leaders or, or your tribal political leaders, you may say that. Especially those whom we see as legitimate, right? You see, in, in another experiment done in, in, the, in Harvard University, it was done by a uh, famous uh, uh, psychologist called uh, Stanley Milgram, right? The results of this experiment was very, very worrying, very, very uh, ominous, right? So what the experiment showed was that we are all capable, like you and I, we are all capable of violating, right, of violating our most cherished values and principles when, when, our, when an authority perceived as legitimate urges us to obey, right? Whenever, whenever those leaders whom you think are legitimate in your eyes, whenever they ask you to obey, you obey, no matter, no matter how, how atrocious their commands may be. You may think that you are uh, that you love your friends and your neighbors who may belong to a different tribe, but then if your tribal leader says, "You know what? They are no longer our friends," you know, to go and hurt them, then you will go and hurt them, right? You will begin to see your friend in a very different light. It is. I, you, may, you may think that I'm. You know, you may think this is just fantasy, but then if you actually think about it, this is what has happened in Nagaland, right? And I'm sure this will happen again if we don't understand these issues properly and try to mitigate it, this will happen again. What the experiment also showed was that the substantial uh, percentage of the, of the participants or the people, right, they, did, they actually did what we're told to do as long as they perceive that such commands comes from a higher authority. The, the one very disturbing, right, one very, very, very disturbing um, uh, disturbing results or findings was that we offer unquestioned obedience with little thought as to the rightness and wrongness of our actions, right? Indeed, blind obedience becomes, blind obedience becomes the norm. We see furthermore that when we do what has been urged by the authority, right, when we do such things, which is something morally depraved and wrong, we don't see such heinous acts as a crime. Rather, we see it as an act of loyalty, duty, and one's attachment to the group and so forth. It's like you proving to your group that, oh, look at me, I'm so loyal to my group, right? Moreover, in obeying, right, in obeying your group, you also wash your hands of any sort of responsibility for your actions, for your heinous acts, because you simply reply back whenever you are being accused that, you, you, you just reply back by saying that, you know, we are not, that I am not doing anything wrong. I did not do anything wrong. I was just, I was just told to do this and hence I did it. I, I'm not the one responsible. So this state of moral vacuum, right? This state of moral vacuum where no single individual bears the sole responsibility for the consequences, for the consequences was rightly defined by the philosopher Hannah Arendt as the penalty of evil, right? The penalty of evil. What do we mean by that? It just simply means this, that what we call evil, right? We like to talk a lot about evil. What we call as evil is often and usually the end result of a chain of action which, for which no single individual bears the sole responsibility, right? Look at the killings that happened in during the ULP election or the killings that happened in the lynching. Who is responsible? Those people who, who do actually took part in beating up the innocent guy, right, and killing him, will you point, who, who will take responsibility for that murder? Or even for the killing that happened during the ULB election, who is responsible for it? Ultimately, if you, if you think about it, no one, right? Because everything happened in the group. Everybody can start blaming, oh, it was not me, you know, I was told by this person to do this, that, what not. So nobody, ultimately in the end, nobody bears the, nobody, bears the sole responsibility for, for the outcome. That's the penalty of evil. And what is even more shocking, and this is something that I want you to remember, what is even more shocking is that such crime, right, or such act of evil 
are usually committed by ordinary, average, law-abiding people like you and me. What you see in the movie, right, of the villains are just fantasies. In real life, the villain, the evil people, right, if you think, if you have watched you know, any kind of action movie, whenever you see the action movie, there's some villain, right? So the villain is you, right? In real life, the villain, the villains, right, are average, ordinary people like you and me, who are, in fact, you may think that you're a very good person. I may think that I'm a very good person, a very good friend. But in reality, you and I are, in fact, capable of committing the most atrocious, the most depraved of acts in the name of our group, in the name of our tribe, in the name of our community, and in devoting our blind obedience to those leaders and authority we see as legitimate, right? If you don't believe me, ask yourself how many times you wish to have committed some sort of heinous acts, right? In fact, if there's no rule, if there's a breakdown of rule in society, you will... Who knows the extent to what to what extent you will go to carry out those repressed tendencies that you have, right? It is therefore not surprising that many of us unquestioningly obey the commands of our of our group, right? Of our group and of its authority, no matter how oppressive and tyrannical. Because it is a way of it is a way of relieving ourselves of the burdens of freedom, right? But when I say freedom, I mean responsibility, right? You don't you don't bear responsibility or accountability for your actions, right? You don't. You find somebody to blame for your actions, and that's what exactly happens in the crowd. Right? Whenever you do follow your your group, whenever you are in a group and you do something wrong, right? Who is going to blame you? Who will pinpoint you? Right? No one. It provides some sort of that de-individuation, all right, anonymity, right? Hence, everybody can beat up the the, uh, the innocent guy. Are you are we going to arrest everybody? You see. So now the issue is like the most important question now becomes what does this mean, all this obligation, all this obedience, conformism mean for the political obligation that which we are speaking of? It essentially means this. It essentially means this that we must bear in mind, remember that leaders and politicians have have long realized, right, they have long realized that a population united is always stronger than those who rule over it, right? That's why since the since the beginning of fully developed civilization stretching back to ancient times, right, rulers have, rulers have, have always asked the 16th century political philosopher, who is it, um, the Italian philosopher, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, right? So, as Machiavelli states that since the ancient times, right, rulers have always, leaders and political rulers have always sought, have always sought to divide the many, divide this population, right? Divide it, divide the many and weaken the force which was strong while it was united through the use of those methods which promotes division. Right? In simple words, right, in simple words, this this simply means that by dividing the population along the lines of tribe and class and religion and gender and political preferences, whatever, whatnot, the effect of crowd psychology, which we have been discussing so far, right? Whenever you divide your people, whenever you divide people or population of a, of a society along these tribal lines or religious line or whatnot, this, this crowd psychology kicks in. And when it kicks in, it renders any rational discourse from happening, right? It renders impossible any rational debate to take place between different groups, right? Because why? Why? Because each group considers its own standards, its own uh, norms and values as ultimate and indisputable, right? And if, if you if you consider, if you think that your group is the best, if the, the norms and values and the traditions and customs that your group, that your society, that your tribe, that your community follows is good and ultimate and indisputable, then there's no way that you can discuss rationally with different group about what can actually help. There's no discussion. By saying that ours is the best, you have by that you have shut any sort of any sort of rational discussion from happening. Right? And when population are divided along groups, along tribes, along religion or gender, right, which are naturally prone, which are naturally inclined to clash, then this offers this offers the rulers with a safe and secure source of their power, right? 
In other words, the more population you divide, the more secure your power is for the leaders. Thus, it makes it easier for the political and tribal leaders to control the masses, to control its people, right? And aim that sentiment, that, that sentiment, that, that crowd sentiment towards attaining certain political and socioeconomic uh, goals. So, for instance, like in India, you can see the caste system. And the caste system in India is huge. It's very, very sentimental, right? If you try to, you know, the caste system, is huge. people will start killing each other for that. In fact, you know, people actually kill each other for that, right? For caste. Or even look at, look at for instance, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue between Hindus and Muslims, right? In India. In India, Hindus and Muslims, they are, they are, they are used against each other for political purposes, right? For political purposes. They, you know, political leaders, you know, the religious leaders, they make use of that sentiments, that, that suspicious, that fear sentiments, and then they create tension. Even in, even in Nagaland, in, tribe, in tribal societies, the, the politicians that we have, all the leaders that you think of, the political leaders, even the underground leaders, they all make use of the tribal division to stay in power. They are in power, why? Because they are in power precisely because they can make use of that division. If they are, if, if they can't make use of that division, they won't be. If, if the society, if the population is united, then all the present rulers, all the present leaders, will not be leaders. They will not even. They will not be able to secure the seat of power. They can't. And they're precisely there, precisely because they can. They make use of that of the, the tribal divisions that we have here in Nagaland or in India elsewhere, right? Which is to say that you know, in a highly divisive and oppressive uh, social and political system, right? In such kind of system, leaders, they, they can only maintain and sustain its control over its population, right? They use a very subtle uh, mechanism in order to control its population in a, in a highly divisive, in a highly divided and divisive society like Nagaland or India. What they do is they try to control the minds of its people, right? You see, very in a, in a very subtle manner, in a very indirect manner. They won't control you directly, but they will control your mind. And the more you identify with your group, the more you identify with your tribe, the more you identify with your caste and your religion, the easier it is to be controlled by the tribal leaders, to the religious leaders, or by leaders who, who, who wants to use you for their own benefit. And you don't even know, and you won't even realize that you are being used, you are being manipulated, right? That you are just a pawn, you are just a puppet. You don't realize that. But then that's the fact. You become a pawn, you, you, you are being controlled. So the leaders, they always try to control your mind, right? If they can control, control your mind, then they have secured the source of power. They have, and they will exploit that division, right? That division in a society to secure that power. And those leaders and rulers will resort to any kind of, you know, any kind of tribal and religious divisions, as the, the, as the very famous George Orwell, right? Most famously said, Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectful. That is exactly what's happening, right? If you just give a quick survey of political landscape here in India or in Nagaland, it becomes evident that the fight for this control over the minds of its population, right? It's become, it becomes more evident, right? Political violence along religious lines in India, right? Or the, or the inherent tribal tension among tribes in Nagaland, right? It's so easy. I mean, all those leaders, all those present, all the MLAs in Nagaland, all the ministers, MLAs in Nagaland, and all the tribal leaders, they are leaders precisely because they are able to make use and take advantage of that division, right? If there is no division, none of them will be in power. None of them will be leaders, right? Think about that. And they are able to, and they are able to become politicians and, and they are able to become ministers and MLAs precisely because they make use, they exploit the division in the society. Do you think whenever the politicians, and I bet you, all the politicians, I dare you, I can even, you know, I bet you, or every politician, you think whenever they say they are against tribalism, do you think they actually mean that? Of course not. It's a lie, right? Like George Orwell says, it's a lie. They don't believe that. In fact, they want they want divisions to happen. They want the divisions to go on. They want tribalism to go on. Why? Because as long as the Nagas are tribal, they remain in power. 
right? Imagine there are some politicians who, who have been politicians for 20, 30 years, and they're still there. Why? Because they're still there precisely because they're able to make use of that division. Without the division, they're nothing, right? We let them control us. So the ultimate question we must now turn to is what can be done to become aware of our condition so that you and I are no longer a puppet to be controlled, to be controlled and manipulated. The answer simply lies in you, actually. Right? The answer simply lies in you. You must free yourself. And when I say you must free yourself, you must free your mind. Right? You must free your mind. When we realize that when, we, when you and I realize that gaining control of the individual's mind is the most fundamental means of control, then it becomes obvious and clear that the first step to counter such a tyrannical force is to undergo the very difficult, so easy, the very difficult process of freeing your own mind. You must become free. You must become you. No doubt, this process, right? of becoming an individual with freedom of mind, with freedom of thought, it's not easy. It's not easy because in order to retain that freedom of thought, you must risk exclusion from your group, right? You must be willing to be excluded from your tribe, from your community. You must risk that. However, this is very, very difficult. How many of you or how many of us are willing to do that? How many of us are willing to be excluded and alienated and excommunicated from your own tribe and community? Not many, right? You may talk high and mighty in front of, of public, taking, uh, talking about how good you are, uh, how bad the corruption is, how bad uh, tribalism is. But whenever you actually must do something, whenever you must actually do something in action, it risks, right? You risk being alienated. You risk being excommunicated from your community. And when that happens, when you are faced with the risk of being excommunicated from your community, would you still believe in, you know, tribalism is bad? Of course not. You won't. And this is precisely what John Stuart Mill, right, the, the, uh, the, the political philosopher, John Stuart Mill, calls the tyranny of social pressure, right? The most dangerous of all tyranny is the tyranny of social pressure. I'm sure of it. And certainly no one, nobody wants to be alienated. Nobody wants to be excluded from our tribe, right? And hence you just simply conform, right? You simply conform and go along and go along with the people, right? You just go along with the people. You don't, you don't question. You become a sheep, right? So you must bear in mind, and it's just, I'll give you a very simple example. If the, I mean, there are, there are students I see like in this uh, for this webinar. If you you may want to become something else, right? You may want to become a sports star or a singer. The, those students over here. But then, whenever you do that, how many times have you faced some sort of resistance from your family or from your tribe or from your community, not to pursue what you want, but actually pursue, you know, try to get, you know, try to pass the UPS exam, NPS exam, and get government job. Even though you don't want to, even though you may not wish to go for government job, somehow you are pressured into it, right? How many of you are? And I'm sure many of you are, many of you are facing that situation. So that's what it means by, you know, the tyranny of social pressure. You must be able to overcome such kind of pressure in order to become, in order to uh, gain the freedom of your thought, freedom of mind. We must bear in mind that this tendency to obey is, is very prominent. It's one of the most prominent features of man. But then very few, very few throughout human history, even in the face of corrupt power, were willing to stand up and refuse to obey. They, were re they refused to let their minds be controlled. And thus, they refused to become a slave, a sheep, right? An undifferentiated atom. So the best manifestation, right? The best manifestation of being free is to remain true to yourself. You be authentic, be original. Don't copy, right? Do not try to be a pathetic copy of by a pathetic copy of somebody by constantly mimicking others, right? Don't do that. Such individuals, whenever you try to free yourself, whenever you are free, whenever you are you, whenever you attain your uh, authentic self, you become one less, you know, one less born in an oppressive system, right? And whether you are aware of it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, you will play a, you will play a crucial role in the rejuvenation of the society, right? It's not an easy task 
to be yourself. It's not by any means. And this brings me, this reminds me of this, uh, as you can see, this reminds me of actually um, of, a, uh, of an episode about, uh, as you can see, this is Socrates, right, Socrates. You see, Socrates, whenever he was, uh, whenever he was, uh, he was put to trial, right, in Athens, the, whenever he was put to trial for the for impiety, uh, for impiety, i.e., you know, not believing what the Athenians were believing, and not worshiping the gods of Athens, and corrupting the minds of the youth. By that, it means Socrates was trying to, you know, was trying to make the individuals, make the young generation think. But, but what happened was that many people in Athens did not like it. They did not like the fact that uh, that Socrates was trying to enlighten and make the youths of Athens more critical thinkers, critical and independent thinkers. So they brought him to trial, right? Which they knew that they were going to punish Socrates, whether, you know, what, what come what may, but they're going to punish Socrates for this. So in return, Socrates did not put up a defense. He did not put up any defense, but he only said this, right? And he only said this, and I want you to, and I'll read it very slowly so that you that you you know that you are that you have that you can be aware of it he said this they spoke to you right they spoke to you when you would most readily believe them some of you being children and adolescents and they won their case by default as there was no defense in other words what socrates was trying to say is this Whenever we are from a very young age, right? We are from a very young age, constantly indoctrinated from a very young age, the virtues and the goodness of our group, of our tribe, of our kind, right? Which is, which is an implicit way or an indirect way of saying, do not question, just conform to what has been taught, right? Just conform, just have a blind faith in your community and just have a blind faith in all those values and beliefs which you are trying to hammer it into your tiny little head. Right? Don't ask questions. And if you are brought up like that, in the end, you will only believe that. Right? You will only believe that. No matter what others, no matter what, even if God comes and tells you not to believe that, you will continue to believe your group. Right? That's what Socrates was saying. Right? And much in the same way, right? Our freedom to think independently, right? is all but you know this is how we are being indoctrinated and this is how we are being told to think and view the world however right however maybe the only way the only way to unshackle ourselves of this change of obedience right this chain of obedience is to disobey to not conform this obedience become essential to push the society forward, right? And it is what is most required, as is uh, mentioned by uh, the psychologist Eric Fromm, right? That those with the courage, those with the courage to disobey, are not only the protectors of freedom, but they are the ones who move the society forward. As he says in your screen, as you can see, man has continued to evolve by acts of disobedience, not only with his spiritual development. Not only was his spiritual development possible only because there were men who dared to say no to the powers, but also his intellectual development was dependent on the capacity for being disobedient, disobedient to authorities who tried to suppress new thoughts. Okay, so with that, I, so I, so yeah, so with that, I end the, the, talk and i will be willing to you know and i'll be i look forward actually i look forward to criticism like especially criticism observation questions but also criticism i like criticism so so yeah so here we go okay thank you so much uh, for your uh, i was having some internet issues so i couldn't join in the beginning i apologize for that but yes uh, i was uh, able to listen to you very clearly and i'm sure there might be some questions and at least we can we can take up so i open the room for the question if there are questions we can take up uh before uh, our forum uh, think about the question uh, I, I just remember the quote from Noam Chomsky. I hope I'm audible. 
So, Noam Chomsky, uh, you have mentioned that smart way to keep people passive and obedient is to trick them in the spectrum of acceptable opinion, but allow very lively debate within that spectrum. So, what is your view in this context? Uh, Dr. Anirudh, can, can you... Uh, can you... Uh, you can also use the chat because I'm not very clear with the thing, yeah? I'm not very clear with your uh, question. I mean, uh, the network was not clear, so I cannot hear you clearly. So can you repeat that? Okay, okay. I will, I will okay, 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 sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and also I, you know, I ask if, uh, like, if you are, if you are not very comfortable asking, you can just type in your questions, right? So that'd be good too. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Can I say to you? Yes. Um, hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, very clear, very clear, yes. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. It was really engaging. Uh, I am a student of Hector College, the fifth semester, majoring in political science. Um, yes. My question is that with regard to the lynching that you have mentioned, I guess, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it is March 5th incident, yes? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, uh, and with regard to that, I, just, I was just wondering that um, the students who were involved in that, like nobody was responsible for that very act, but then um, what do you think about, uh, you know, that the education playing a role in uh, molding the, or shaping the minds of the student? And uh, is our education system doing enough in molding or shaping the minds of the young minds like me or my friends? Thank you, uh, Sachu. I think, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question, actually. And yeah, the education system has to be blamed, really, no, to be honest, because the kind of education you get, trust me, I mean, I feel so sorry for your generation because the kind of education you're getting is just, please forgive my language, but just pathetic, really. They never teach you anything outside. You know, you're, uh, first of all, the, the syllabus is very, very all outdated. Second, for for like for your generation, you are not taught any sort of critical thinking. You are only told to follow. You are only told to obey. What is a good student? A good student is somebody that obeys the teacher. But that's not the case. You must be told how to think. You must not only believe what your teacher says, because most of your teachers, what they say is wrong, right? They are wrong. They're just fully completely wrong. And this brings back to the issue what, of what you were saying, uh, what you were discussing about that uh, students are in the lynching. You see, nowadays, your generation, especially the younger generation, the youth generation, you are more or less indoctrinated about certain way of viewing the society, right? Certain way of viewing the society, certain way of perceiving the society. You are, you, you, I mean, right now also, in your own personal life, can you disobey anybody in your life other than your, other than your siblings, younger siblings? Right? Nobody. There's nobody that you can go and, and disagree with. And if you disagree with somebody else, you are you know, very quickly put down, right? So much in the same way that what you saw or what you saw in the uh, what you saw in that um, that lynching process is that that the sentiment, the vile, savage, barbaric sentiment about your own group, right? Oh, you did this, you non and you know you non naga did this to a naga you go you got my point, right? Nobody was able to reason, right? No reasoning. You were so, because you and I, we are so indoctrinated from a very young age. Oh, you're Naga, you are this tribe, you're this community. Hence, if anybody does anything to you, you should take it personally, right? So that's the kind of mentality that young, that, that your generation, that, you know, that your generations are indoctrinated into. You don't even know that you are controlled by your community, right? So, so those young stupid students, right? Yeah, of course they're stupid. Who told them to be there, right? They have been indoctrinated. Oh, it's Naga and non Naga. You see that the thing, the boil, it just shoots up, the blood just shoots up into their head. So there's no point. You can't reason with them at all. Moreover, 
whenever individuals like you and like like you especially if, like youths like you whenever you are immersed in the crowd whenever you are in the crowd you are just you are no longer you what made you you what uh can you say to you right what makes you what makes can you say to you can you say to you is lost you are now part of the crowd and whenever you are in the crowd you you gain some sort of power right yes or no right that's why you want friends whenever you walk with your friends you have some sort of power with you right so once you are immersed in the crowd like i said the power the reason is lost and moreover in the crowd there's so many people right so it gives you anonymity right you can do things without people finding out right you can do things without without letting others find out that you have done it right? unfortunately for those stupid students you need their, their pictures are everywhere in the internet right if you just check it out so what happens is that in a crowd because the crowd gives you anonymity even a good person becomes very very bad things which you would never do when you are by yourself you will do in the crowd that's why in the crowd right whenever you are whenever you see in a protest whatnot the most violent people are the most low abiding citizens just imagine that the most violent people in the crowd right the most violent people in the crowd are the most violent citizens right just imagine but the thing is this if you are but here's the, here's the, here's the thing if you truly know who you are if you are not trying to mimic others if you truly know who you truly are then you will not be manipulated even though you are in the crowd you will maintain your sanity you got a point right you will maintain your sanity so that's why be yourself but the thing is the education system presently in nagaland and elsewhere in india is that we don't teach you how to be you you got a point right that's the failure of the education system if we teach you who to, uh, if we teach you to be you then even though i place you among a group you will still maintain you will still be you you will not do stupid things you got a point so i hope i've answered that question for you is that clear i mean did i answer your question can you uh, can you say you okay okay good good You guys see me and hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, yeah. So uh, my my actually the thing is uh, the thing just uh, my uh, network just crashed. So, uh, Doctor uh, Anirudh, can you kindly also please <laughs> please uh, restate your question because <laughs> it's gone now. The question which you have, you know, so <laughs> diligently. <laughs> It's, it's, I, I understand. I understand because you are in Bombay and I'm. Oh, okay. Oh, really? So we both share. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, no. I was just uh, thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Noam Chomsky uh, somewhere mentioned about you know the best way to people You know, is to limit the scope of their opinion. Yes, yes, yes. yes. At the same time, lively debate. Right. So on one hand, uh, you are allowing people to talk. Uh, but, but they are keeping uh, a very uh, narrow scope for their arguments, right? So how do you see such a grand political psychological complex? I mean, this is exactly what democracy is all about, don't you? Think? You are allowing people to talk, but you are, you know, giving them or uh, a very small spectrum. Uh, who is giving them a small spectrum of? Uh... To, to voice out. Oh well, this is what uh, no job. Okay, right? 
that while limiting the spectrum of acceptable opinion allowing very lively debate right on one hand you know uh, the limiting the spectrum of acceptable opinion there and on the other hand the debate is also encouraged right don't you think uh, i mean what i mean is that rather than restricting the voice your opinions are restricted your opinions are not denied but your opinions are restricted right okay so okay, okay so um, i i apologize to everyone on your uh, um, connection i'm sorry i'm sorry but but from what i from what i uh from what i can catch up all your question is yes uh doctor uh, i'm sorry uh, noam chomsky you bring up a very good point john noam chomsky uh, chomsky uh, in one of his um um uh, writings he he termed what is known as manufacturing consent right by manufacturing some sort of consent right? but then that consent is not a consent of everybody but then they are trying to limit the scope of what is who can say what what can be said right where it can be said so all the limiting also it, it limits the criteria of of what you can actually say so so the opinion that that, that in, a, in a democracy like us in in india like democracy especially in democracy by having by uh, some, some sort of limit what the population or or or, or citizens can say that is exactly the point because here even even in uh, in, a, in a very tribal society or you 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 would not because i think i think you are the one who studied in uh, who specializes in that caste system with the um, Ambedkarian study. So you see, even in caste system or in religion or in tribal system, right? You are already limited to what you can do on what you can say. What defines you? The thoughts that you can hold, the beliefs that you have, right? What are good? What are bad? What is good? What is defined as beautiful and true? They are all limited. Imagine that even even between the Hindus and Muslims, in in for instance, in political spectrum, in political context. It's already defined that you know you can do this, you can't do that. In India, you can you cannot have a prime minister who is who is like implicitly who is a Muslim, right? Or imagine imagine a tribal politician becoming a prime minister of India. That's not possible, never, right? Like even when the world comes to an end, it never happened, right? So much in the same way, everything is limited. It limits you from saying. It limits you from. Truly exercising who you truly are. You can, you are limited to what you can actually, you know, uh, um, think, think and say, because by limiting those uh, those spectrum of legitimate voice or opinion, you are already those who have who, who have framed the criteria of what you can say are already controlling you. So your opinion does not really matter. And moreover, in the tribal society and even in the caste system, you actually don't have anything. I mean. It's sad to say this, but then we think that we are individuals, we are free, but then we are not free. In fact, even those people who are here, right, and those people outside, they think that they are free, but they are not. Why? Because the, the view of the world, the opinions that you hold are not yours. It's your opinions, your beliefs are something that has been told to you, that has been indoctrinated into you, that has been hammered into you, right? Most of you, if you are a Hindu or a Christian, you are a Hindu or a Christian because you were born into a Hindu family or a Christian family, right? Most of you, if you are what not, right? You may, you may say, oh, I'm this tribe, I'm that tribe. Why? Because you were born into that tribe, not because you had a say, and you can't even have a say, right? The sad thing is that you can't even have a say now. Right? So, much in the same way, we are already limited, and even our worldview is already limited. That's why we are no longer free. There's a limitation to what you can think, how far you can go. It's already limited. You cannot truly fulfill the human potential that you have, mainly because you ascribe to your own community or to your own group. So, so I hope I have answered that. And if not, you can ask me again a clarifying question. I'll, 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 you know, you can type it actually to run the route. Then I'll, you know, explain it better. I suppose. <laughs> Anything else? Any questions? Any criticism? Any observation? Yes. Hey, can, yeah, can I come in?
Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. One more question. Uh, hi, can I come yes, in? Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, no, not, uh, I mean, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Saliki, for the very interesting uh, observations. Uh, and uh, Yeah, but not so much of a question, but uh, rather um, a curiosity from my side. Uh, the examples that you have cited about the crowd mentality and all this, uh, I was wondering if such behavior comes nearer to conformity rather than obedience. I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, okay. This, um, should I repeat the question, Dr. Salikyo? Yes, yes, repeat. Acha, okay. Um, yeah. I was wondering, I'm just curious because this is not my area, um, the examples that you have cited of mob lynching and the crowd. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if this behavior comes nearer to conformity rather than obedience. I mean, when we yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, I got your point. Okay, that, that's a, that's a, actually that's a good point. But I think uh, you see, I think conformity and obedience is more or less the same. So from 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 a psychological perspective, it's more or less the same because to obey requires an element of conformity, right? You, you obey, why? Because everybody else is doing it. You're, you're trying to conform. Why do you obey, for instance, whenever you're in the university, you, you obey to certain rules and regulations, why? Because you can't be the one, you won't be the only one in the university or the college or in the workplace that does something else when everybody's doing something, when everybody's following, conforming to certain certain way of doing things, right? And if you try to diverge from that, if you try to disobey, then you are not conforming, right? So, from a psychological perspective, from a psychological perspective, the issue of conformity and obedience they have the same underlying uh, they have the same underlying roots of it. They have an element of each other in it because you can't never you can never say that you, you are obeying without an element of conformity. Obe obedience has this uh, has as its roots the the element of conforming. Right, you are conforming to a certain standards of. Of way of doing things you are conforming to a certain way of thinking whenever you obey your tribal leaders whenever you obey your tribe you are conforming to your tribal traditions to your tribal beliefs right you're conforming to that it has more to do with i think it is wrong to you know nitpick uh, when we speak of psychological factors because they are closely related they are close tightly interrelated you can never separate them so you can never speak of obedience without saying some sort of conformity. Whenever you obey, you are conforming, right? You are conforming to it. So, yeah. So I think that's. I think if I've clarified, or if that's, if you want me to clarify again, I'll be willing to do that. Sir, I I want to yes. put up a question. Daniel here. Yes, yes, Daniel, tell me. So, thank you very much for saying the proper way to double it. I'm not concentrating on the model in Nagaland. I just want to, I think others should, others should uh, meet microphone. Only let my microphone be open, then the voice will be left. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, my question is not like uh, on the basis of Nagaland uh, lynch, mob lynching, but like uh, like abrogation of 370, you know, Article 370, we, we have seen recently. And uh, at the same time, they have, the government has banned the internet 
In the same time, government used the Preventive Detention Act in order to uh, detain those politicians so that they cannot influence the mass people for mass agitation. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is a democratic country because like freedom of association, freedom of uh, expression is all about uh, like pressure groups, you know, we need pressure groups uh, so that pressure groups will put, continue to put pressure upon the government so democratic system will function smoothly. So, suppose uh, people, uh, due to any reason, they come in, you know, as a group and they hesitate against the government. So, yes, in the group, anything can happen because their motive may be to have a non-violent way, but it can turn into violence because we cannot give guarantee 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 5 lakh people gather together. So, there might be non-violence also take place, you know. So, but uh, hesitating against the government is also very important, you know, in this manner. I'm not talking about the Nagaland issue. That is different. That is it's a different thing. So what I mean is, uh, it is also against the human rights what the uh, government has done against the 370. Article 370 removed very good, but using, uh, using that MISA, under MISA, that maintenance of internal security, under MISA Act, and then under TADA, na, Terrorist Detention Act, all this. So uh, I feel like uh, in a democratic country, people should be allowed to you know, hesitate like this. What do you think? Yes, you're right. I think um, in a democratic country, you are you are allowed to agitate, and you must be allowed to agitate. But I think whenever I speak of, uh, but then if you um, think about the crowd in general, like protesting, whenever you have this catering mass protesting, if you actually think about it, it's always there to stop something, right? They're never there to build anything. They're always there to stop something. We have to stop the uh, we have to stop uh, the citizenship amendment act. We have to stop the farm bill. We have to stop this. We have to stop that. It's, we have to stop the ULP election. We have to stop. You see, there's nothing about building anything, right? It's always about stopping something. So what I was trying to say is that yes, in a democratic country, and you're right, you must be allowed to yeah, to come into associations and then you know have some sort of a pressure group towards the government. But on the other hand, sometimes, especially in a very tribal society, in a very highly divisive society, in a very, very diverse society like India itself and in Nagaland itself, sometimes this gathering is not, uh, is not the solution. Or maybe it's some, it's, you're never going to get anywhere with that. I don't think so. And I don't think you'll get anywhere. And... Uh, what they did in terms of you know the government trying to remove uh, whenever they remove article 370 and try to restrict the uh, like you like you rightly mentioned they try to restrict uh, the uh, organization of means people forming into groups and protesting against government is i think that though, you see the government we cannot really say that the government is good or bad but then they are in a sense trying to limit people right from stopping from from stopping the government uh, from from not they are trying they are not they are trying not to let the people interfere in the government in the workings of the government whatever that may be be it good or bad I think we make a constant mistake that you know the government is always there to do good but in politics I don't think the government is there to uh, I don't think the government is there to do good we say we use the term democracy but then democracy in actual sense don't happen in India it doesn't happen anywhere in the world right so. You're right. I think uh, we have in, in a democratic society we have to maintain certain sort of uh, right to form association and then you know have pressure. We must. We must. But then sometimes it is good, like you said, it's right. But also sometimes in in sometimes I don't think it is good. Also, right? I don't think it's because in I it only agitates whenever people do come together in this kind of form in groups. It only agitates. And it only certifies and solidifies the divisions in the society. That's my that's my that's my feeling. That's my idea. That's why I'm I'm not a big fan of crowds because, and I'm not even a big fan of those protesting because, in many cases, protesting won't get you anywhere, right? I mean, we have seen during the uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, right? Many people were protesting everywhere, but 
what happened? Nothing happened, right? Even in Nagaland, you know, so many protests happened, uh, so many protests and ban happened, right? What, what did they achieve? Nothing, right? They only did to stop something. They never did to construct anything, just stopping something. And that also is colored with tribal colors, right? The tribal colors. I mean, in those kind of scenarios, right? Even me, I'm afraid to even go and see also because who knows right, what may happen. It's very, it's, it's, it's something that I don't, uh, that I feel like the crowd is not only a democratic, it's, it's not only a force of democracy, but remember, most of the authoritarian government came to power by using crowds. See, look at Hitler, look at Stalin, look at Mao, even look at Modi himself, right? He's a populist, right? Even Donald Trump, he's a populist. You can never tell them they are, they are, they are truly a democratic leaders. They are not. They are more or less a, a, a populist. They use the crowd for their own kin. And that's precisely my point. You use the crowd. That's what politicians do. That's what leaders do. They try to exploit that. And they come to power with the power of the crowd because the crowd cannot think. You just tangle meat in front of them and then the crowds are stupid, so we just go and grab them. You see? So that's, that's the thing. So, yeah, yeah, so you're right. 371A, return, I'm sorry, 370 is, the government should not have, I don't know, but they may have a better reasons. But yeah, in, in a democracy, yes, you're, 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 you're supposed to be and you're supposed to have freedom to form associations. But yeah, in democracy, yeah, but then that becomes a, a forming of association that becomes actually a, a way to, to anarchy, you can say that, or, or a way to fascist, like Moti, right? Like Hitler, like Stalin, so, yeah. Uh, thank you for the hey, question. Hey, if you hey, have more, and if you want me to clarify. Sir, I think yes, yes, uh, yes. the student, one of the students also asked, you know, about uh, one person and he said, like, critical critical study is very important but i really like that because it is easy yeah, yeah. You know? yes you're right yeah. discussions and critical study mm -hmm. is uh, uh, taking the example of whatever is happening around in and around country or outside you should take the example and explain to our classes that is one of the need actually and yeah. then, uh, another thing like yes you're right yeah. yeah, yeah. Another act like TADA, no, the Terrorist and uh, Disruptive Activities Preventive Act. Uh, there also BJP government has made a lot of amendments. Like they have made it very, very uh, strict. Now uh, anyone can be can be declared as terrorist if you are found, you know, linked in certain certain things. So it is. It is not. It was not like uh, what it was before during Congress time. They just recently last year they have changed it. In the same time, they they also changed RTI Right to Information Act. You no, know? here now we cannot get A to Z information. They also they they have uh, not made some changes in amendments where people cannot access all the information. So, uh, what do you think? No, if if they continue like this. So I'm sure in future there will be more uh, uh, bigger kind of, you know, uh, this one, uh, what to say, agitations, you know, by by any group. <coughs> You're right. So we cannot take it as it's, it's a wrong movement you know, by the people, whatever they agitate, because we love our country. So we have to go against the government and the government is a, it's, it's not a, this one, they cannot uh, run the country through cent uh, democratic centralization process. Now, uh, BGP government is doing like the way it is happening in Russia or China, democratic centralization. Now, the 60, 62 crore uh, farmers in India, out of uh, around uh, more than 50% people are farmers in India. So, the farmers bill, they did not even uh, consult with any farm uh, farmer associations and all. So now people are farmers are educating. So likewise, I think government when whenever government follow the democratic centralization process, like Indira Gandhi also did sometimes for the national emergency calls. So likewise, I think it is the right of the people, no? Because Article 19 gives us that of power, no? Uh, because we are a political science teacher, we'll be teaching students freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of writing. And in the same time, we will say that you are like that, you cannot attend the uh, pressure group. I don't know how to connect it. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, to, to get back to your point, I think, yeah, and the thing is, how many outside of, like us, 
know about all the changes that have been uh, all the changes that has been made with regards to terrorist act. Not many, right? You see, you get my point. Not many people know that. Only you and only only people who are here knows that, right? So there are cross and cross of people who don't know that their lives have changed, right? The rules have changed, but they don't know. And it's in the interest of the of the of the government or those in power to to do that. Because it's better to do things hidingly, right? And the thing is, once, like, like you rightly mentioned, that those changing by changing the laws, they've made, they've made, um, they've made, the, they've made changes so that it restricts you in so many ways, right? It restricts you. But the thing is, this the government is trying to how do I put this? By restricting what you can say, they are also trying to put up some sort of uh, how do I put this? Some sort of um, some sort some way to distract you. You see, distraction. It's very very essential in in trying to control anybody, to control your mind, right? To control the mind of the population, you must not only restrict what they can say, what they can do, but also you distract them. So, so that if you are distracted here, if you are distracted here, you can make their scope of freedom even lesser, right? And they wouldn't even know it. And that's exactly what's happening with this with this government, right? And then this government, the BJP came not because of democratic power, but because of populism and whatnot. And then what they've done is that they've made sure that they've, they'll distract the people of India like this. And then when everybody is watching over here, they'll slowly reduce the freedom of expression like this. And in the end, you will not even know. That's why I mentioned in the, in the, in the discussion that we will not even know that we are being controlled. Right? We will not even know that. And that's exactly what's happening. I, we don't even know that our lives, our freedoms are being limited day by day, and then we are just distracted over here. So that's, and that's why I feel like, I, and I may be wrong, and you may be right, but I feel like there won't be any protests. And even if there's protests, it'll be like very few, because many people are you know, distracted with something else, not with, not with this. And in modern society, in modern democracy, in modern uh, uh, democracy, people care more about this dangling distraction than the actual freedom. And in fact, like I said in, at the beginning of the lecture, that we try to, the, the, the burdens of freedom is too much. Because when I say freedom, by freedom it means responsibility. That you must be responsible for your actions. You must be responsible for your life. But many people nowadays, are, they don't want freedom. They don't want responsibility. They want things to be given to them, right? They want things to be given to them. They don't want responsibilities. It's too much to bear. That's why, who knows? And I may be wrong, and you may be right. Later on also, whenever our freedom is you know, limited more and more, we won't even protest. That's my fear. That's my fear. So yeah, but yeah, you're right, yeah. Okay, sir, thank you. And I feel thank you. They're, take, they're taking us in this way also. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay, is there any question, please? Is there any other question we can take up? Thank you. Yeah. I think Gabriel wanted to ask. Yes, Gabriel has, yeah. yeah. Hello, good evening, sir. Oh, good evening, good evening. Uh, sir, yes, I joined in late, yet I find this point very, uh, you know, something which, uh, a question which is to be pondered upon. So, you did mention about, uh, you did mention three points that is, True to oneself, be authentic, and do not mimic others. But sir, uh, see, my, um, in our Nogas society, we live in a pretty conservative society where we are asked to follow the legacy our ancestors have left behind, and uh, you know those kinds of restrictions like drive restrictions, claim restrictions, and so. Uh, I mean, everyone has their own ways of understanding, but through my uh, through my understanding and through my through my own point of view, I see that uh, I'm uh, what I feel is that we are not mimicking. I mean, like. Mimicking as in we are, I find it, we are mimicking our ancestors. And then by authenticate, I think what I feel is like uh, authenticate as in being a Naga. So, and then, sir, uh, so with the changing generation comes, uh, or like there's a saying, with the changing generation, there comes or demands a changes. So, uh, with the, uh, can we change a little with those demands? Or like, um, I mean, uh, getting straight to the point, my question is, how do you suggest to be uh, oneself in a society where our society is always uh, that crowd, crowd follower or, you know, uh, as as you have mentioned about, uh, I, I think, sir, I, I hope you can link or connect the points with, uh, with, your, with my question, sir. 
Yeah, yeah. A good point, Gabriel. I think uh, you bring up a good point, actually. Um, the thing is this. Whenever, whenever you ask that, how do you be, how do you remain uh, true to yourself? How do you be, how do you, how do you, how do you remain you? Right? That's the thing. So it's, you see, it's not going to be easy. Never think that it's going to be easy. That's why not, that's why many people don't like to be themselves. Why? Because it's not easy. Because to be you, it requires, and it, it gets, and maybe the solution, and maybe, if you are, if you really, really, really like press me on giving the answer, then it's very, very personal to answer, right? To do the topic, this political opinions. It comes back to, to the very personal level of you, of you, the person inside of you. To be you, you have to stop being a shallow person, right? But it's not easy, right? It's not easy in a world where you're surrounded by shallow, superficial people, where the world worships material things, where the world worships you know, oh, I belong to this tribe, I belong to that tribe, I belong to that clan, right? It's very, very difficult. It's also very difficult to even stand up and even tell your parents, the closest one, not forget about your, your tribe and your community, but even to your own parents, you can't even stand up and say, oh, you know what? I don't want to become this, I want, I have, I want to become this, but you're wanting me to become this. And you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to follow my, my dream. But you can't even say that. And even when you say that, your whole family, your whole clan, your village will come and you know beat you up. <laughs> and then you have no choice but to follow that. You see? But even if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to get all the blame and all the whatnot and still follow your dream, that requires some sort of courage, right? That requires some sort of authenticity inside of you, in you, that you want to follow your dreams, you want to follow the kind of person that you want to be. Even though you 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 will have so much so much pressure given to you by your family, not just by your closest family, but by your family, your friends, your tribe, your community, I'm not even your village also, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing is this: it's not easy. Never think that it is easy, Gabriel, to, to become to become you. But then it's difficult, but you must. And the only way to become you is just be you. Don't try to. Don't try to do or say things that is not you. Never accept what I'm telling you right now in its face value. Caution it. Whatever somebody, whenever somebody tells you something, don't just blindly accept it. Even if it comes from me, from, from your own family, from your own trusted friends and families, don't blindly listen. Think, think to yourself, is what I've been told relevant Right? Relevant? Not just relevant, but is it, does it correspond to the reality of my life? Does it correspond to the reality of my own life, of my own society, of my life? Don't just simply accept it. Question. Question more. Right? That's how you become you. That's how you maintain yourself. And once you start questioning, then trust me, even if I put you in like a, like a answer to the first question, even if I put you amongst the crowd, you will still retain your individuality. You will still retain your unique self. You will not follow the crowd. And you can't because you are you, right? And you can think, you can question, right? So if you can do that, that's the best way. The, the, the best way is to start questioning. Right, start questioning because right now the, the 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 beliefs that you hold is not yours. You have just you know mimicked your ancestors, your, your tribe, whatnot. I don't know. Right, it's the, it's the the beliefs is not your belief. The norms is not your norms. The customs is not your customs. You must start asking that question and see and see if that's relevant to the world. If and see if that's relevant to your own life. In other words, in a simple term, like Sir Daniel has mentioned. Critical thinking, think critically. That's what I say, think critically, ask questions. Then you will become you. It won't be easy, it's never easy, but you must. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, Gabriel. If you want me to clarify again, I will. Yes, yes, sir. That, that was to the point, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for the verification, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so I've got another question over here. Uh, Sidung La, she says, I'm just curious. Her question is, what is the solution to your argument? As long as societies remain, leaders will be there, okay? As long as leaders would be there, obedience will naturally be there. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's obvious, right? 
So obedience will always be there. Yes, obedience will be there. I'm not saying obedience, we should, we should never, you know, I'm not saying that we should get rid of obedience. Obedience will always be there. But then whenever, it, but in most cases, in most cases, like I said, in some cases, like parent and children, obedience is required. Sometimes you have to beat the children to, to, to make them straight. But sometimes we have to remember that whenever we talk about these things, right, political things, because it is very easy to, it is very easy, I found, and with all the talks I've given, I've, I've realized that it's very easy for people to simply generalize and say, oh, what you're saying is this, no, no, I'm not saying that. We must remember, it is con contextual, right? Never forget the context. Don't simply generalize to everything. Whatever I'm saying, don't generalize. It's never meant to be generalized. You have to be kind of idiotic to say that, okay, whatever I'm saying has to be generalized. It has to be contextual, right? The context of what? Context in the society that we live in. Context to the group that you belong to, right? The norms, the values, the customs that you believe, right? In that, whenever you follow somebody blindly, I'm sure, I'm sure that you obey, right? I'm sure that you obey, but do you think that by obeying, you are doing any good to your own society, or even to your own, even to yourself? If you ask that question carefully, you will find that no, you are not doing that. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I'm talking about, Okay, I'm talking about obedience in that context, where where you don't have to necessarily blindly follow the leaders, blindly follow the customs. You must ask yourself that question, right? If you feel like that by by doing this is wrong, then don't follow it. But if you think that it's right, right, and if you think that what sometimes the group will not always be wrong, sometimes they'll be right. If they're right, go along with it. If they're wrong, say that, hey, maybe, maybe this is wrong. Maybe we need to do this. That's what I'm saying, right? That is the whole point of obedience. Obedience also uh, requires that you, you, you don't blindly obey. You obey with caution, right? You obey by understanding what you're obeying. That's the whole issue, right? You, you can't just simply say that you, that means always the leaders are there, always with obedience, so what do we do? The solution is this. Don't obey blindly. Even if you obey, right, understand what you are obeying, right? Don't blindly obey. Because right now I can I can show you, if you go out and listen, right, if you go out and listen to anybody and ask their beliefs, and even ask about their religious beliefs and whatnot, you'll find that many people don't even understand what they believe in. So if they don't understand what they believe in and they still obey what they believe in, that then they are blindly obeying things. I hope you're getting the subtlety because Nagas don't get subtlety. Trust me, Saga and Nagas are the worst people to understand subtleties, right? So the thing is, you obey, but then you understand what you're obeying. And if you understand what you're obeying, then you will know when to obey, when not to obey, right? That's the issue. So I'm not sure if uh, Susan, I'm not sure if I've answered your question. If you want me to clarify, I'll, I'll clarify again. But that's a good question. Sir, I want to add with the answer. Sir, 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 thank you so much. Sir. Yeah. sir, sir, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, now it's almost almost the time. It's almost the time to... Hello? Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. sir? Yes, so it is almost time to say goodbye because it's... Uh, 40 almost and for your time and i really apologize that my internet is not working but uh, whatever i could do my level best to listen to you i have already done and once again to and such event one more time with you Thank you so much on behalf of uh, Dot Talk with so organizing the team. I express my humble gratitude and say thank right, thanks once so again thank to you. you for and thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the